So Dr. Sharkey, first, I'd, I'd like to thank you for joining us and thank you for coming and talking to our audience. This is something that hits really close to home here in Houston because we've recently been having a very vigorous debate on introducing some of these aerial robotic systems to our law enforcement. And the general public really has not had a chance to be educated on this topic, so you joining us today is, is very, um, very helpful, sir. And we thank I'm you very that. pleased to, to join you, Barton. I'm very pleased that you're running a show like this because it's very important to get this out to the, to the public and let them know what's going on. No, most, most definitely. And I have to admit, Dr. Sharkey, I am literally giddy as a schoolboy. I could hardly sleep last night. I kept having dreams of robots every time I woke up because I've been reading up on all of the articles trying to find as much literature as I could. So I am charged up and ready to go. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and jump right into it. Um, do you really believe that human society is ready for this technology? Um, definitely not. Uh, we, well, it's, it's not even just that human society is not ready, it's the technology is not ready for human society. That's the problem, really. Well, you know, I was thinking a lot about it, and it seems that this kind of technology, I would argue, is almost even more dangerous than nuclear weapons because it's going to be so much more applicable to everyday living. And it, it seems that we're introducing it very quickly into everyday society without having any kind of debate or any kind of real policy discussion over what this means, over the ethics of especially using it for law enforcement, and especially, I mean, even using it to in a battlefield situation. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, uh, I lost my thread here because I was um, thinking about what you said about the aerial surveillance over Houston. Um, well, the thing is that we're, we're, we're going at it very, very quickly. But, but the danger, um, I get your point about nuclear weapons, and I, I've given this a lot of thought, actually, because obviously nuclear threat is much more powerful than a bunch of robots shooting us. Nuclear could kill us completely. But the thing about nuclear is we all know that it can kill us completely, and that's why the United States and Russia didn't fire their missiles at each other. In, in some ways, I think the nuclear threat kept us from fighting each other, dangerous as it was. But the thing about the robot threat is that it, it doesn't seem that kind of dangerous, and it will gradually happen, and that's what I meant by sleepwalking into it. I mean, United States are, are the only autonomous stuff that the United States are using in military now are really the mule supply truck. All the rest of the robots they use, the 4,000 robots they have on the ground in Afghanistan, uh, sorry, in Iraq and, and, and in Afghanistan, are really used with humans in the loop, so they're teleoperated and they remote control them. And, and you know, th there's lots of good reasons for using them. We don't want to see soldiers being killed by roadside bombs, do we? I mean, that's... No, of course not. Here. But, I mean, you know, it, 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 that goes down the path of uh, when we remove the human element from having to, to you know, be face-to-face -face with... I mean, what happens when there's a soldier who's literally, it looks like a video game, 5,000 miles away, and he's wiping out villages and he doesn't know whether or not they even have accurate intelligence or if he's being told the truth by his superiors i mean there's just there's a whole dynamic of problems that are introduced here of deception of accountability that that i just i don't even see how you can get around it no exactly uh, back home and they do, they have to decide really quickly whether to press that button or not and i believe that nobody has ever refused to press the button well I what mean, can they really see of course. I mean, it's not, you've completely dehumanized the target at that point. I mean, they're a, they're a blip, they're, they're not even real. And I mean... It's not even, it's not even actually the dehumanizing the target, because uh, Dick Wetherington, Dyke Wetherington, who's, who's your deputy head of uh, your defense association for unmanned vehicles in the aerial vehicles, has said that, you know, to, to have dog fights in the air, I mean, it's okay in Iraq, you've got no problems, there's no other planes there to shoot down your predators and your reapers, but to have dog fights with equal force, I presume he means Russia or China, then they would have to go full autonomy. He reckons that you couldn't have a dog fight with remote control. So that shows the kind of limitations of using a remote control. It's, it's, not, my, it's not really my remit to talk about the remote control ones, but they nonetheless worry me because I keep reading about them. Well, no, and it's phases of, it's phases of introduction, uh, introduction and, I, and I see what you mean. You know, it, it becomes its own kind of psychological arms race. You know, we have to use the robots and let the, them have full kill 
capability because the enemy's going to do that anyway, and then they're yeah. both racing towards that. But I mean, I have to say, Doctor, I, I really, I'm kind of a futurist and a dystopian futurist at that, although I, I do not enjoy that, that role. And the articles I have in front of me, you know, I, I'm looking at this thing from where are we 20 years from now when, you know, your own British mili uh, Ministry of Defense, I don't know if you read this article, they released a report a couple of months ago uh, about the, their version of the future. And, I mean, I've read numerous policy reports by the RAND Corporation, um, our own Department of Defense, and their, their future scenarios of, of – you know, how these technologies are going to be applied, a lot of it has to do with domestic control uh, and subverting and controlling the, the home populations. And I mean, quite. I know. And when you when you start looking at it from that point of view, and I mean, just real quickly, let me just uh, just go through just a couple of these articles. You know, sure. all over the U.S., the police are implementing these these drone aircraft. The Pentagon is exploring human fear chemicals. The um, they have these new weapons that can make people sick. They have sound wave cannons to control the populace. They have, uh, you know, in London, they just, or in your, your part of the world, they just tested a James Bond style tank that's invisible. Um, and I mean, then you combine, then you come, I mean, and literally the article soldier says, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it for myself. So I start looking at this and I start nexusing all of these different types of technologies together. And what I come up with is literally, you know, hive controlled, uh, robot armies that you have a flying hover drone that's a couple thousand feet up watching everything with insect, you know, 360 camera panoramic view. Then on the ground you have invisible tanks with force field technology shooting, I mean, sound wave, I mean, it's, it's literally science fiction. I mean, it sounds like we're talking about science fiction here, but the capability of these these robot systems, these and any of these technologies, especially when they're combined into one unit, to be used in any scenario and just be completely uh, incapable of defeating them with conventional, any kind of conventional weapon or resistance is just... Oh, we're, we're pretty clever as humans, though. We'll, we'll fool them and trick them. I, I'm more optimistic than you, I think. But, I mean, I've been reading the dystopian... I'm all probably quite a bit older than you. I was born in 1948, and I read all the dystopian literature as a teenager and as a child. And, like, we're well ahead of those things now. But 1984 has arrived in the UK in many ways. We, we're completely covered. If I go outside the, into town, outside the door, I'm filmed and photographed five or six hundred times. I mean, we're way ahead of you with surveillance, I think. And our police are already using drone helicopters. Three of our police services are using micro-drones that are really quiet. They're very small. They can hover above you silently, film you, and also record what you say. So, so we're, we're there. It's not really future stuff. I know, but yet the general public is completely unaware and anesthetized to the effects that this is going to have on their society. Exactly. But, I mean, I, I have to be very careful. Um, I mean, I have my own views about the future, but I, I, I personally have to be very careful not to go much further than near future, nor do I need to do that. <laughs> Definitely. In, in, well, in, in my position, what I'm trying to do is actually to have influence on the military to stop using these things, you know, and I can't go ranting at them about far future things, you know, even though I think about it. I really have to be careful because I think there are so many threats just coming up in the next five or six years, enough to keep me going, really, for the, for the, for the next five or six years. Well, um, no. But we haven't even talked about the, the idea of, I mean, we're talking about remote control things here. Um, but the idea, if you read the, I mean, everybody in the United States can read the roadmaps. If you type military roadmap, or naval roadmap, army robot, USA robot, into Google, you can get a 250 report from each of your armed services. And if you read those unmanned, unmanned vehicle reports, it will make your hair stand on end, the things that are planned in the near-term future in the next 10 years. 